Good morning. Welcome to a little bit of a Sunday morning experience on this March 22nd Sunday. This last week we have seen and experienced, and experienced increased government restrictions in order to curb the infection rate. We've all learned and adopted a new phrase this week, flatten the curve, a phrase that we'll probably always think or reflect upon in our memories as the COVID-19 pandemic. From now on, whenever people will hear FTC, they will no longer think of the Federal Trade Commission, but flatten the curve. Maybe you've experienced some dissidents, as me, this last week. Like the news of hearing that you should remain at home, and yet going out and seeing the streets busy and full of traffic with all kinds of other people that are also being told to stay at home. The news has also been told to us that we should avoid large gatherings, and yet Hundreds and hundreds of people go shopping at Costco all at the same time. Or maybe you've walked into a grocery shop and seen fresh fruit and veggie aisles untouched, and yet the fruit or the frozen fruit and veggie aisle laid bare. The bread aisle full and the flour aisle empty. I'm always surprised, or I'm surprised to learn how many people know how to bake bread. On a personal note, I made sourdough this week, and it turned out well. We've all been encouraged not to panic shop, but rather to build up our stores gradually, thus leaving food for other people. And yet, we have witnessed, heard, or have seen that this has not been our response. There are some people who have even tried to take advantage of the situation by buying up supplies and reselling them for exorbitant prices on the internet. We are indeed living in interesting days. I have never experienced anything like this. We have been told to be cautious, to be considerate. We have been told that there will be enough food and supplies for everyone, that essential services will continue, and yet we behave like it won't be. And in other ways, we behave like things are normal, and in some ways we also behave like things are abnormal. We live in this unprecedented circumstance, and this has led to some rather unnormal behaviors. Now this reminds me a little bit, or reminds me of our text that we have for this morning from John 9. The way an unexpected circumstance led to some abnormal behavior. A man has been healed, a man born blind, who has lived blind ever since, suddenly has a sight given to him, for which he is overjoyed. I would consider that a normal response, but everybody around him seems to have abnormal responses. His neighbors are doubtful and suddenly think he has a twin brother, his parents are fearful, and the Pharisees, well, they're doubtful and skeptical, they're disparaging and angry. It seems that only Jesus, the one who healed the man, seems to be pleased and happy, like the man is himself, to be healed. So, let us continue by reading our scripture together. I'll be reading from the ESV, that's the New, or the English Standard Version, and I will be starting in John 9, verse 1. As he passed by, that is Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It is not that this man sinned or his parents sinned, but that the works of God may be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, while it is still day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but it looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees, the man who had been formerly blind. Now, as it was a Sabbath day, when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes, 
So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there were divisions among them, so that they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how now he sees we do not know, nor do we know who has opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So, for the second time they called a man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you, know, do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anybody opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Now Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see and those who may see become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Now, as I said before, this is an interesting story about abnormally normal behavior. It's a story about a man who was born blind, and is given his sight, and yet he wants to rejoice, and yet everybody around him doesn't seem to want to. So let's look at the different characters that the blind man encounters after being healed. The first people we meet or encounter are his neighbors, and their initial reaction is surprise and doubt. But I guess it should not be surprising. If my blind neighbor, who I knew over a lifetime suddenly could see, I would be surprised too. I would like to think that my natural reaction would be to ask how this came to be. And this is what we see among some of the neighbors. Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? But there is another group that doubts. Their reaction is not a wonder at the miracle, but to question the man's identity. No, but he is like him, they say. It's a different fellow that just looks like him, and sounds like him, who we all knew to be blind. But the blind man, he protests, no, 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 it's me. Well, how? How is that possible? They want to know. The man called Jesus. He, he opened my eyes. Well, next question is then, so where is he? Where is this Jesus? The neighbors want to know. They want to know where Jesus is. Possibly to go see him, to go hear him speak, maybe even to question him about how he healed this man, maybe to confirm the facts. 
why they wanted to see Jesus or know where he was, we're not told. But there probably were a variety of reasons. But one thing that we do not see or hear them doing is rejoicing and celebrating with this former man who was blind. Instead, because Jesus disappears and they can't seem to find him anywhere, they take the blind man and they bring him to the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, they're the second group of people whom the blind man encounters. And they also question the blind man in regards to how he came to his sight. And the conclusion that the Pharisees come to regarding this event is that Jesus cannot be from God because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. This conclusion is challenged by some, though. How can a man who is a sinner, that is, Jesus, and healing him on a Sabbath, because healing is considered work, or mixing mud and water is considered work, and working on the Sabbath is considered sin, so Jesus is a sinner. How can one who does not keep God's commandments do such a thing? How can a sinner do such a thing? And the Pharisees, they're perplexed by the situation. And so they ask the blind man what he thinks. Well, the blind man says he must be a prophet because only somebody from God or a spokesperson of God could be able to do something like this. And there's even examples in the Old Testament of some prophets doing this. If you were to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, you would read about Elisha and how he blinds the Armenian army and then returns their sight. But then again, the Jews, the religious leaders, whom the, to whom the blind man speaks, they do not believe in him. They do not believe the testimony of the blind man, so they call his parents. And again, we move on to the next group of people without any celebration or rejoicing about what has happened to this man. So the parents of the blind man are called, and they're questioned about how this came to be. And his parents, we are told, are fearful. You see, they're afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue, we are told in verse 22. It says, The Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Now, to be thrown out of the synagogue is a little bit different than maybe being thrown out of a church, at least if we want to think about it in today's terms. Because to be thrown out of the synagogue was a very serious thing. Because the synagogue wasn't just the center of religious life, it was also the center of communal life. To be cast out of the synagogue would mean to be cast out of, well, the community. It would mean serious social ostracization. Think about this last week, what we've experienced. We've been asked to distance ourselves physically from one another. But we still, have means, we still have means of communicating with one another, whether it's by phone or FaceTime or Skype or text or different forms of social media. But even though I have these tools, I've still missed getting together and seeing people. Now, if we were to think about compounding that, how much worse would it be if your whole entire community were to shun you? They wouldn't speak with you. They wouldn't help you. They would not even get together with you. This is not just physically, but in all forms. This is the threat of the leaders of the synagogue have made about those who call Jesus the Christ. This drastic action by the Pharisees, we get a sense of the threat that the Pharisees felt Jesus was to them and to the Jewish faith. In this section, or in this encounter with the Pharisees, and the parents, we get a sense of fear. There's fear on the parents' part because they fear social isolation. But we also have fear on the part of the Pharisees. I think a part of the Pharisees' fear is that they just don't know what to make of Jesus. They're afraid of what they don't know. They know the law and they know all the historical debates around the law and how to keep it. But this Jesus, he, he just blasts the law wide open. He doesn't play by their rules. And so they're afraid. They're afraid of the unknown and what it will mean for them and their faith and their community. Now the parents of the blind man, they fear their future. They fear a future of being separated from the community. And so they too refrain from celebrating. And even more so, they actually distance themselves from their son. And it's a little bit sad. 
So after the Pharisees get nowhere with the parents, they go back to questioning the blind man. And now the blind man is perplexed because he's told them his story, his parents have told him his story, the people in the community have told the story, and yet they're not buying it. And so they come to the blind man once again. They say, tell the truth. We know the man is a sinner. We know Jesus is a sinner. So how are you healed? I told you, said the blind man, Jesus healed me. If he is a sinner, I do not know. You can debate that. All I know that I was blind. Jesus put mud on my eyes and washed them. And now I can see. Do you want to become his disciples? Now, the blind man has made the decision to follow Jesus, and he naively asks if that is their intention too. And this makes the Pharisees rather quite angry, and they respond rather quite harshly. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Moses had credentials, but Jesus, he's an unproven quantity, a Galilean up upstart a lawbreaker, and he is not to one to be trusted. Well, says a blind man, gaining some confidence, and he goes forth and rebukes the Pharisees. We know that God does not listen to sinners, he says, but if anyone worships, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. In essence, what this blind man is saying is that we should give glory to God. This should have been our response. This is what my response is. This is what I want to do. This is the normal response. After receiving healing the blind man, all he wants to do is thank God in front of God's people for this wonderful thing that has been done to him. And it's what we should do as well when we are also given unexpected miracles in this life. But instead, the Pharisees, they don't want any of this. And they're enraged and they curse him and throw him out. And so, the blind man being thrown out of the community and left alone is there. And it is at this time that Jesus hears about what has happened to him and comes looking for him. And Jesus asks him a question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Messiah? Yes, yes I do. But who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? The blind man wants to know. And Jesus, looking straight into his eyes, says, I am the one who you can now see standing in front of you. I am the Messiah. And then the blind man does what he's been longing to do all this time, the most normal thing. He worships Jesus. He celebrates, he rejoices, he gives thanks for this wonderful thing that has been given to him. This unexpected circumstance required a normal response. We are experiencing an unnormal circumstance. This coronavirus but as Christians, we are called to give our normal response in faith, to trust in God and to trust in the Son that he sent, Jesus. Two thousand years ago, God took on flesh in the person of Jesus to reassure us that we are not alone. Emmanuel, God with us, we often say at Christmas time. Two thousand years ago, God took on flesh in the person of Jesus to tell us that we are loved. And that no matter what befalls us, Paul tells us in Romans 8, there is nothing that can remove God's love and concern for us from us. Now, faith in God does not mean we throw caution to the wind and ignore our health authorities' advice. But instead, we are still called to move towards one another in love. And ironically, in our current situation, that means we stay physically away from one another for the moment. Staying physically separated for the moment, however, does not preclude us from reaching out to one another, to forming community, from connecting with one another, and showing concern. We have technology today that disciples of Jesus did not have 2,000 years ago. We have phones, we have texts, 
we have email, we have FaceTime, we have Skype. I mean, if you wanted to, you could even walk by somebody's house and wave from maybe the lawn or something like that. Being physically separated doesn't mean we cannot also does not mean we also cannot pray for one another. So I have an idea, something normal for us to do together. Let us gather in the spirit every evening at 7 p.m. to pray. This doesn't have to be a long prayer, but something significant, a prayer for the community that God has placed us in. And so we don't forget, I encourage you to set an alarm. And so, if you're not sure about what to pray for or how to pray, I have five sort of ideas of, or five different groups of people that we can pray for. And we can pray giving thanks and asking for God's peace and calmness and healing upon these five groups of people. We can begin with praying for our families and then for our neighbors and for our church and also maybe the local church that is in your area. We can also pray for our health care workers and our government. And lastly, let us also pray for the world, for different people in different countries. If you want to, you can pick a different country every day. And so, in concluding, why don't we enter into a time of prayer together for these five different communities that we are connected with? Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks that we can gather together to be your people in different places. As we normally would have gathered this morning, we are separated, but we are still one family, we are still one community, we are still one church. And so we pray for our families, whether spiritual or they're physical. We also pray for our neighbors, those who live next door to us, or those who we know from afar, whom we love and we are concerned for. We give you thanks for the Niagara United Mennonite Church and the community of faith that it is to us, for their spiritual mothers and fathers who have passed on their faith to us, who have taught us to trust in God through difficult situations. We pray for all the healthcare workers in Canada, in Ontario, in Niagara. We ask that you would keep them safe and that you also give them wisdom. We pray also for our government, for our leaders, both federally and provincially, that they will do everything that they can to help the people of our country to be safe and to help us through this type of this difficult time. And lastly, we also want to pray for the world and for the many different countries and the people in different countries that do not have a healthcare system as good as we do. Watch over them, care for their sick, care for their young and their elderly, for the vulnerable among them. We think especially of our brothers and sisters in the United States, that you continue to watch over them and give them peace and assurance that you are with them. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.